Hello and welcome to this week's Sabbath School lesson. We are in the third quarter and lesson number 10. Um, the lesson is entitled Husbands and Wives Together at the Cross. Uh, before we begin, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Holy Father in heaven, God, we thank you for this beautiful book of Ephesians that we've been uh, studying this quarter. We thank you that every book in the Bible has so much to offer, has so much insight into who you are and uh, uh, it gives us so much insight into your character and what you did and why you did it, Lord. And uh, we thank you for um, the book of Ephesians as well. And uh, we thank you for this week's lesson, especially. We pray that as we open your scriptures, as we try and understand um, what Paul is trying to say in this chapter, um, number five, Lord, we pray that you'll give us the help we need to um, really understand what uh, this passage means. And uh, uh, may we not just remain hearers of your word, but doers of it, Father. We pray that you be with each and every one who's listening, who's tuned in, and whoever's going to listen in the future as well. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to each one, Father. We pray that um, uh, we will be able to get a, a clarity in this subject and uh, every deception or misunderstanding any of us may have in this subject, may you um, break those chains for us to be able to see clearly uh, the truth that you have intended for us to understand from these passages, Lord. We commit this time into your hands. We pray that you be with me and speak through me, Lord. We um, um, thank you for being with us so far and uh, we ask this in the most holy and sweet name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, husbands and wives together at the cross. It's a really interesting topic we have here this week. There's also a lot of misunderstanding around this subject. And hopefully we'll have a clearer view by the end of this lesson. Here in this lesson, we see that through the passage of Ephesians chapter 5, 21 through 33, Paul writes down his counsel to Christian wives first and then to Christian husbands. It's also important to note that he continues on and goes to children and then parents and finally moves to slaves and slave masters. Here, Paul is trying to shed light on the structure of family and relationships. When we think of family structure of a household in general, we quite obviously think of a married couple, their children, and possibly a house pet, right? But, but when we try to dig into the more contextual scenario of this passage, we realize that a household consisted of many more there were children and parents, there were slaves and slave masters. There were also other people who were not necessarily part of that family or that household, but were counted in because of work or businesses. So it's a much broader dynamic in the first century when compared to what we call a household today, which we also, of course, call nuclear families, right? So now, since family is such an integral part of every person and it's such a personal and impactful space in everyone's life, Paul is giving the people a new perspective, one that is from the view of God and in accordance to his designed structure for every household. We often do things the way our forefathers did them. And sometimes we try to get an objective look at those same things and our perspectives may change. Here, Paul is giving them a new perspective, rather the most important perspective, which is that of God. It's also interesting to note that Paul spends more time on his counsel to the husbands and the fathers and also slave masters by asking that person to model his behavior on the behavior of Christ. Now, the common viewpoint of these passages that we're talking about is that is very dated and that Paul was simply trying to conform Christian behavior 
to what is expected in the wider world. In fact, we see that Paul is really challenging the, the, patriarchal, author the patriarchal authority that people believed in um, back in that time. And he's simply pointing to Jesus to show what authority really means and the role that each one plays needs to be seen from God's perspective rather than what was cultural. Monday's lesson talks about the church as the bride of Christ. The author has put it all together beautifully. He writes, as Paul in Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verses 25 to 27 and 29, shapes his wedding marriage metaphor for the church and its relationship with Christ, he draws creatively on the customs and roles of an ancient wedding. In relationship to the church as bride, Christ is the divine bridegroom who, one, loves the church as bride. We must never forget that this is heart work for Jesus. He loves us. Two, gives himself as the bride price. In, in the context of ancient wedding arrangements, the bridegroom would, quote-unquote, purchase the bride with the, quote-unquote, bride price, which was usually a large sum of money and valuables, so large that ancient village economies depended upon this custom. Christ pays the ultimate price for the church, right? Um, his bride, since he gave himself for her. In the incarnation and at the cross, he gives himself as the bride price. Now, I'm reading I'm reading this as it is because I, I really can't uh, make it any better or form it, you know, try to explain it in any better way because it's been beautifully written. The third thing is he bathes his wife, his bride, the the preparation of the bride was an important part of the ancient wedding festivities. As is also true today, it was the bridesmaids and female relatives of the bride who prepared her for the ceremony. Paul, though, imagines the divine bridegroom preparing his bride for the wedding. It is he who sanctifies and cleanses her by the washing of water a probable reference to baptism. Four, speaks the word of promise. This cleansing is performed with the word, pointing to the word of promise that the divine bridegroom speaks to his bride, perhaps in the context of the betrothal ceremony. Now, betrothal was the ancient version of modern engagement. Um, but was a much more serious set of negotiations, which included a written agreement about the bride price, which of course came from the husband, and the dowry, which were assets that the bride would bring to the marriage from her family. Five, prepares and adorns the bride. When the bride is finally presented to the groom, she's fabulously beautiful, appearing in flawless splendor. Christ not only bathes the bride, he prepares and adorns her as well. Using one final element of the ancient wedding, Paul portrays Christ as the one who, number six, presents the bride, of course, to himself. In ancient times, the bride would be given away by the best man, best men, or her father never by her groom. Here though, Paul imagines Jesus presenting the church as bride to himself. It's very interesting. We see that um, um, although brides were presented to the bridegroom by the father or by best men or just one best man, um, here, Jesus being the bridegroom, he is presenting the church as a bride, but to himself. Moving along, we see that um, Ephesians 5, 
verse 28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Paul has detailed the ultimate example of love, Christ's love for the church, offering a drastically different model for husbands than the usual one. He points again to that great example, asking Christian husbands to respond in the same way as Jesus, who gave himself up for his bride, the church, and attends to her every need. Paul challenges Christian husbands to turn from the expected practices of their time and seek to match Christ's tender love. I want to talk for a minute about the wives submitting to their husbands. I know that people hesitate to talk about it, especially men, because they don't want to offend anybody. And with the rising of the extreme feminist uh, movement, it has played with people's minds. Let's understand something. God made everything with impeccable order and structure. So even when he created man and woman and designed a family unit, it's no surprise that he designed structure and order into its core. There's, a, there's an hierarchy to family. God is the supreme head of every family. Then the man of the house, the husband, and then the wife, which is of course then followed by children. Let's also quickly glance at how Christ is supposed to be the example for the Christian wives as well, just like we've seen the correlation with man and his role, right? First, Christ is the ultimate example for both. All of us are to look at Jesus as our example, not just inside a marriage, but in all aspects of life. There's a passage in Friday's lesson that is taken from the beautiful book, Adventist Home. It reads, the question is often asked, shall a wife have no will of her own? The Bible plainly states that the husband is the head of the family. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. If this injunction ended here, we might say that the position of the wife is not an enviable one. Many husbands stop at the words, wife, submit yourselves. But we will read the conclusion of the same injunction, which is, as it is fit in the Lord, which is taken from Colossians 3.18. God requires that the wife shall keep the fear and glory of God ever before her. Entire submission is to be made only to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Entire submission is to be made only to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has purchased her as his own child by the infinite price of his life. There is one who stands higher than the husband to the wife. It is her redeemer and her submission to her husband is to be rendered as God has directed, as it is fit in the Lord. So oftentimes we see that um, wives or women just in general can can take this verse into meaning that you submit to your man as though you are submitting to Christ. But that's not what it says, right? We just read, God is the ultimate head, the supreme authority that whether you're a wife or a husband, that's the authority we answer to. That's the one we submit to completely. And after that, for a wife comes the husband. So wives are to submit to their husbands. Um, we need to give them respect and allow them to be leaders in our household. Now, it's a large subject that we, we cannot really dive into in this lesson. So lo let's look at the next verse, which is uh, verse 31, um, chapter 5, verse 31. It reads, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father, sorry, father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Unfortunately, there are many models that have been 
created today by modern society and the one flesh model is almost disappearing in society at large. Most marriage models promote individuality and how we need to be our own person and the other the other one has to be his or own his or her own person as well and somehow that's supposed to work of course the the rise in divorce rates will prove that those models don't really work and of course that is not the model that god created for us god's one flesh model is all about unity it's about coming together and building oneness. It teaches us to put the other one before ourselves. And if we follow this model, God can show us, or rather show to us, his divine purpose for both husband and wife together and how he can use them as a unit to accomplish his divine purpose. So to anyone who's listening, if you are a husband or a wife, um, I would encourage you to um, take your marriage to the Lord. Um, ask him for help and guidance and strength to be able to look at this relationship as, as one flesh. How God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit have come together for this divine purpose of um, the redemption of man. So also man and woman when married together um, are one our one flesh in thought, in in planning, in, in the things that you do. We're supposed to have that unity, that oneness. And it teaches us to put the other person before we put ourselves. Um, we live in such a um in such a culture of self-centeredness. We we talk about, like uh, I mentioned earlier, individuality. We talk about, oh, I want to be able to be who I am and this person that um, that I'm going to marry has to just accept me the way I am. But that's not even that's not even um, the way God designed us to be sanctified, right? The whole the whole meaning of sanctification is for you to change from what you were to becoming what you're supposed to be, what God's plan was for you originally. It's the same thing God uses a marriage unit, that family dynamic to um, teach us so many wonderful things. And this has been a beautiful lesson for me to learn. And I hope that uh, um, y'all will be able to take something um, back from this lesson. And um, um, I pray that um, we'll be able to see you for the next lesson uh, in the next week, God willing. Um, let's bow our heads for a, for a word of prayer before we close. Our dear God in heaven, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for the things you've put in place, Lord, to um, work in us, to ultimately save us into your kingdom. Whatever may be the price, we know that uh, you want us all to be saved. We also know that not all of us are going to be saved in this world, but we thank you that you have done everything in your power and you continue to do so, Lord, that we may have no excuse to make if we don't make it to heaven. We thank you for the structure of family, for the for the role that you've given a man, for the role that you've given a woman, for um, this beautiful institution called marriage that you've created, Father. We thank you for the wisdom in which with which you did this. We pray that we'll be able to adhere to uh, your ways, uh, that we'll be able to recognize the, the discipline, the order, the principle with which you created this dynamic. And we pray that we'll be able to um, submit to your word um, in, this, in this aspect, Lord. We want to commit everybody who's listening into your hands. We pray that uh, you'll be with them in their personal lives, no matter where they are spiritually, uh, what they're going through. We pray that you will touch each and every heart and you will work in each one of us that each day, Lord, we may walk one step closer to you, that we may grow in you, that we may reflect you more and more in our lives. We thank you for the privilege we have of technology, that we can uh, share these uh, lessons online with people uh, from the comforts of our home, Lord. We thank you once again for uh, this blessing. And uh, we submit each one who's listening into your hands. And uh, we ask this all in the most holy, sweet, 
and perfect name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you and see you next week.